Good morning, Adelaide and indeed the world. My name is Con and I am the conversationalist. And yes, as usual, I have my latte in tow. Uh, and for those of you that wonder how many I consume a day, I have three in the morning, one after the other. I need my caffeine. This morning, I'm uh, very pleased to have my guest, Samantha Riley, from all the way from Sydney. Good morning, Samantha. Hey, Con. Great to be here. Absolute pleasure to have you. Samantha is an authority positioning strategist, best-selling author, speaker, and host of her own podcast, Thought Leaders Business Lab. Uh, Samantha has is a panelist for the last two years for the Stevie Awards, which is Women in Business. Samantha has also built multiple businesses over 27 years and grew her first seven-figure business from the ground up before she was 30. Samantha now works with experts to be positioned as the trusted thought leader people turn to and has a passion helping people to create their businesses so they can live their life by design. Samantha, I'd like to start first up. I know when we spoke earlier, you uh, or well, when we first started chatting online, uh, you, you mentioned that you were from Adelaide originally. I um, was. Tell me what prompted the move to uh, to the Big Smoke. I felt like at the time there were some personal things that were happening in my life that I wasn't real wrapped about. Things like divorce. They're, they're never fun to go through. <laughs> Let's just pull out the D word right from the beginning. <laughs> um, and at the time, I was actually part of a business group and, and all of the friends that I'd made in that group were already living in Sydney. And um, so I'd been wanting to move here for a while. My daughter had actually moved to Sydney. She was, um, at the time, she was a, um, a singer and a dancer. So her agent was in Sydney. So she was living here. Um, and I went on a, a cruise in Europe with a group of friends um, from this business group. And while we were on the cruise, someone said to me, what are you doing in Adelaide? Like, you know, shouldn't you kind of move to where all the friends are, where the opportunities are? So anyway, I flew back from Europe, flew into Adelaide Airport at something like 7 a.m. By 9 a.m., I'd put a call out on Facebook and went, Anyone got any uh, any ideas of where I can live in Sydney? And by 12, I'd secured a place and uh, I was here within three weeks. Wow. That is very, very whirlwind. Uh, you did mention earlier that you're uh, not a big fan of Adelaide weather. I uh, hate Adelaide weather. I love Adelaide. <laughs> like you guys have got the best food there. Uh, I love Adelaide food. I love um, the, the cafe scene, the restaurant scene. I hate Adelaide weather. I I don't think people realise how cold it gets there. You know, we're, Melbourne's known for being cold, but far out Adelaide gets cold. Yeah, we were um, uh, we were four degrees this morning, so uh, it was uh, it was definitely definitely a little bit chilly. Yeah, and that wind that comes straight off the you know Antarctic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're blessed. Um, so <laughs> you, you mentioned the Stevie Awards. Uh -huh. uh, women in business. Now, yep. what what actually is it? What talk, talk, tell us more about what the Stevie Awards actually are and what they represent. So, the Stevie Awards are a um, a global uh, awards for business. They've got many categories. It run it runs all year essentially. Um, so, they've got different categories. I think uh, the the categories that I um, judge or I'm on the judging panel for are more around the women in business, women entrepreneurship, um, all sorts of different categories. I think in the, the panel that I'm on, we, we're, we oversee something like 30 categories. But these awards run every day of every year and it's just they're incredible for, um, you know, people, anything to do with careers or business. Um, and they're, they're out of New York, so the company's based in New York. Mm. Um, generally, they would have a, well, they used to <laughs> before we, until we were all locked down, of yeah. course, around the world, um, you know, they would finish the year with a, with a fantastic conference where they bring, you know, all sorts of people mm. together um, to collaborate and to learn and to look at new insights. So um, I would imagine that there would be a heap of people in your world, Con, that have won mm. Stevie Awards. They're a, a really, really great um, 
builder of your authority as a business owner to actually to go forward to just mm. even go through the judging process I think is fantastic to be able to you know have take a, a a look at your business see where you're at and pull some of that data out I think even in itself is a really valuable exercise how did you get involved in that they reached out to me on LinkedIn how good's LinkedIn? Um, and I believe that's how we connected too. Absolutely. Um, but they reached out to me on LinkedIn a couple of years ago, asked if I'd be interested. I put in an application. They got back to me and said that they'd love to have me on the panel and um, and invited me back again last year. They've invited me back again this year as well. So I must do okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, got, you got to keep your job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good on you. Good on you. In your uh, intro that you sent me, you mentioned that you built your first seven-figure business before you were 30. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Would you like to share what sort of a business that was? Absolutely. And th and these businesses that I'm about to talk to are still around in Adelaide. I sold them and I believe that they're still running. Oh, they were when I was there mm -hmm. last at the beginning of 2020. Um, so my whole life, uh, I was a dancer. I absolutely love dancing, specifically um, for most of my childhood, it was specifically ballet, but tap, musical theatre, jazz, the whole bit. Mm. Um, at the when I was twenty, I had um, I was working in corporate in one of the local uh, governments or the local councils over there, mm. um, and I had two little kids and at, at that were both preschool aged. And at the time, my husband was working shift work, so we had two preschoolers. I was working in the day. We'd do this changeover in the street, tag. <laughs> exactly, tag your it, <laughs> swap the car seats over to the other person's car, grab the kids and the person would go to work. So we didn't see a real lot of each other. Um, we didn't, you know, I didn't get to see a lot of my kids at that time because I was working and I just was like, I really don't like this job. I'm a creative and I was working in the finance department, which is so far from from my um, what my skills or my genius zone, I guess. Mm. Um, and I thought, what is it that I want to do? And I was like, well, the thing that I know more than anything is dance. So I actually opened a dance studio when I was 20. Um, and within six months of that, what had happened was, and I think this is the entrepreneurial side of me, mm. I would be asking the parents, you know, or telling them this is where you need to go to get your uniform and it was in the city. And as you know, in Adelaide, everything's 20 minutes from each other. Yep. But on a Friday night, if you had to go in after after work, you know, you'd hit peak hour traffic and it would take 30 minutes to get into the city. And it was oh, like, shock horror. right? <laughs> so I actually thought, well, why, why are the only dancewear stores in the city? This is crazy. There's, there's a huge, um, you know, the, the mortgage belts on the northeast side, on the southern side, mm. there's, that's where most of the children are that dance. So I opened up a dancewear store within six months um, out in the northeast in Adelaide. And um, we, it started small. It started in the front of our dance studio. And I think with, with, within sort of five or six years, we were one of the top dancewear stores in the country. So, wow. yeah, we built that. Um, it, it, in hindsight, it was quick. At the time, it felt like it was slow and hard work, but it, we really did grow it quite quickly. And, um, and they're still in Adelaide. There's uh, one out at Unley. There's one... Um, Oh, I believe it might be still there at Windsor mm. Gardens. I don't really know. I haven't would been like, there because would, would like we're all locked down. Free, would you like to give them a free plug? Absolutely. What, dance, of, dance FX. Dance, dance FX. FX. Yeah, and uh, my dance studio was Premier School of Dance, and that's definitely still there. There you go. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you're in the northeast and you're looking for dancewear or a, or a dance studio for your kids, um, yeah. look, 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 look those two up. They're still there. Originally <laughs> started by Samantha Riley. Absolutely. On a napkin in a McDonald's restaurant, of all things. <laughs> you know, I, um, one of my uh, clients many years ago in the, in the commercial furniture industry said to me that uh, uh, most of his deals were done, uh, contracts were done on a napkin in restaurants mm. mm -hmm. uh, rather than, uh, you know, <laughs> the detailed contracts. So, yeah, never, uh, ne never question those little meetings and those serviettes. Absolutely. Samantha? 27 years uh, in business and uh, no doubt we've we've seen some changes in the way businesses are marketed mm -hmm. certainly from from then to now we're in this digital age where there's just and covid has obviously magnified that by a billion times mm -hmm. what would you say is one of or the one constant from when you started your business 27 years ago 
to what uh, an entrepreneur or business owner needs to do today to be successful? Uh, I know the answer to this straight away, and it's understanding that business is personal, that we do business with people. This hasn't changed the whole time I've been in business. And even though the online world is huge, that's where I play, that's where my business is built now, that I'm still catching up with people on Zoom. When we can fly around the world, I still do that. I still catch up with people because we people do business with people. So whilst the platform might be different, you know, back in 1992, I was putting leaflets in letterboxes. Mm. I, I wouldn't bother doing that anymore unless I was a local business. I sure. might think about it. And and now, you know, we might do Facebook ads or Google ads or, or you know, be on Clubhouse, whatever it is. The, the platform's different, but it's still exactly the same. You still need to build those personal connections, not just with your future clients or your prospects, but also with collaboration partners. I think collaboration is the best way to grow a business. Um, and I think that the business owners that get this are the ones that will go far. Mm. That wasn't the answer I was expecting, but. Uh-huh. <laughs> excuse me here while i write down collaboration cons cons notes you've given me a wonderful segue into into my next question <clears throat> uh, there's a saying that says we deal with people to the extent that we know like and trust them mm-hmm. and uh, again you know in your introduction uh, you, you mentioned about trust and getting thought leaders you know to be trusted as experts in the, mm-hmm. in their field how do we build that trust? And particularly if you're just starting out. So we're seeing this uh, uh, plethora of uh, uh, coaches in the coaching space. Mm -hmm. And obviously everyone starts somewhere. Absolutely. How do we build or how do they build that trust from, uh, from the ground up? Mm, This is such an interesting question because obviously, and you would know this when you're asking, there's so many different facets to this. I think first up, and I'm a big believer, and this goes against what a lot of experts would say, but we all have our first day. Every single one of us have our first day. And I hate this that person hasn't been doing it for long enough. Like that's got to stop. Everyone has their first day. But in saying that, I think that there has to be an authenticity for where we are in our journey. So don't come in on day one saying that you've been doing it for, you know, you've you've been able to, you know, afford your mansion and your and your Ferrari. I mean, yeah. we've all seen those, yeah. those ads. You know, don't do that in the first six months. It's just people's BS radars are really going off. So be really, really... Um, honest about where you are in your journey. But in saying that, just because you're at day one of your coaching journey doesn't mean you're at day one of your career. So also don't forget that you've probably got 30 or 40 years experience or 20 years experience in whatever you've been doing in the corporate space or in your own business. So really understand how you bring that with you. Don't, I think you said it just earlier, don't dump the the baby with the bathwater. Um, make sure that you bring all that with you. So that positioning, need you need to really consider where have you come from and where do you want to go and, and bring those two into alignment and position yourself there. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit like people looking for a job and experience required, but they haven't got a job yet. So how can you get the experience without the job? It's a bit like the chicken and the egg. Mm. But but you're right. We have there's just way too much in social media nowadays. You can rent a Ferrari. You can stand in front of somebody's house. It's just you're right. The BS mm. is just absolutely off the charts. Absolutely, uh, and, and, and it's all about being 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 honest, being really authentic, and and, and where you're at. Yeah, and I think I, I just realised I didn't fully answer your mm. question because you asked how do we build the trust. Mm. So it's about being honest ab- and about where you are. It's being authentic about who you are. Like, what are your values, and how do you display your values and and show your values through what you create? I, you know, back in 
I, well, you know, I'm a kid of the eight, the seventies and the eighties, and I remember those <laughs> old, uh, the you know, the magazine articles with the you know the men in the suits, and they always were looking at their fancy watch on their wrist. You know, <laughs> that's how we knew that they were successful. They always had a had a fancy watch, but we don't do business like that anymore. We, I think that we we really want to connect the, with the person that we're doing business with more so than what we did, you know, back in the 70s and the 80s. I, I could be wrong and I'd be, you know, willing to open that conversation with someone, but I really believe that we we need to connect with that person now. So the way that we build that trust, and, and let's just break down that know, like, and trust. I think a lot of people think that the trust means, do you trust me as a person? If you, you know, um, had a heart attack in the street, am I? do you trust that I would give you mouth to mouth and keep you alive? Well, yeah, I would. But it goes further than that. What that trust actually means is do you trust that I will deliver on what I say I'll deliver when you give me money? That's what the trust really means. So you need to be able to position yourself in a way so that people know that. Mm. <clears throat> We, there's many terms that on particularly in social media that uh, have become almost part of our lexicon when we, you know, when we talk and communicate. And indeed, thought leaders is, is one of those. Mm-hmm. And we see these terms and I, I want to ask you as in your introduction, how, how would you describe what is a thought leader? Mm. A thought leader is someone that is, I guess, like let's break it down to the most basic, is someone that can pull their thoughts together in a new way to explain what they do so that it's unique, so that it's innovative. Now, what's really interesting about this is that, I mean, technically the word thought leader should the, the idea is that it is bestowed on us, that other people tell us when we're a thought leader. And I do get that, uh, that thought. However, my thinking around this is unless you're willing to call yourself a thought leader, are you actually going to get to the point where you are? It's, it's almost, it's taking on that, um, th- you know, this is who I am and then becoming that. If I was going to, um, you know, put together uh, some thoughts around whatever the topic is. And, you know, I've heard that from 50 people before because I wasn't born knowing this information. It's come from other people, right? But I take it and I use it uh, and I pull it together with my own experiences and come up with my own thoughts. I could share that the way it has been imparted to me. I could share that in a way that it sounded like those other 50 mm-hmm. people or I could pull it in and say, okay, so if I, if I was a thought leader, how can I share this in my unique way? And I believe that this is, this is um, what we need to think about is how if we were a thought leader, is this what I want to put out? And this is what the filter that I use to, to put everything through. Is this good enough as a thought leader? No, it's not. Okay, so what do I need to do to take it to the next level to share those thoughts so they're unique to me, so they're simplified, so that those thoughts are distilled to their purity, so that people understand what it is that I'm talking about. So, um, you know, like I said, there is a lot of people that say, well, thought leadership is bestowed upon you. But I challenge people to think, well, if you bestowed it on yourself, how would that change what you were doing from day to day? And I watch people change as they they come up with that idea. Oh, okay, no, all right. The way I was doing that probably wasn't, you know, good enough to be a thought leader. Let me keep working on that. And, and I think that that's what it's about. Mm. One of the challenges we also have, moving on from that, which again is a wonderful segue, thank you, is the there's obviously so many uh, social media platforms, uh, there's how many billions uh, billions of users on social media. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a plethora of coaches in in a variety of disciplines. How do you cut through the noise to stand out? Mm. The, fundamentally, if you're a, if you're a, um, we'll call them a, a life coach, or, or, or as I am, I'm a communication speaking coach. The principles, the fundamentals, 
are the same. I understand and take on board what you said in regards to, you know, being a thought leader and trying to disseminate, re-put together and distribute that information in a unique way is you, that's challenging sometimes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do you, how can you like, yeah, what, what advice could you, could you give in that area? Yeah, to the positioning. Mm. It, this is about really understanding what your, um, not just what your knowledge is, what your expertise is, but start to bring in your experiences. Like, where is your genius zone? And really starting to hone in and distill as deep as you can to what you do. Because, yes, either of us, I guess, could be a life coach or, mm. you know, a business coach. And we're not going to, we're just going to blend in with all of the other life coaches and business coaches. And we're generally not looking for someone that's a life coach. When we've got a problem that we want solved, we're looking for someone that can specifically solve our problem. At the end of the day, we think that (laughs) we are unique and one of a kind and that no one else has our problems, but they do. And we are unique and one of a kind, but there is lots and lots of people that have got the same problems as us so this is about being able to speak to one person so obviously communication is your zone of genius so you've sort of dived into that um for me I could be a business coach but it was about sitting down and saying okay what what in business am I best at well it's not it's not numbers, you know, it's about breaking things down into smaller pieces. It's about helping people to understand what their unique piece is that they bring. And now how do they use that to get ahead in business? Well, that's to do with their positioning. So we're starting to break down what are the pieces that you're really good at and putting them together in a way that is unique to you. So um, what's your title again? Uh, public speaking and communication training. Yeah. Yeah. So you could you could say I'm a speaker and people would say, okay, that's really cool. Or by saying that you're a communication speaker, when someone else down the track goes, I need a communication speaker, someone goes, I know Con, he's a communication speaker. So it's about being remembered for exactly what it is that you do and also being understood what it is exactly you do so that when someone's got that problem, they go straight to you for that. Okay. How... Uh, how critical on a scale of one to 10, let's say, is it that if you as, uh, again, we'll use the coaching space as a as an example, that you claim that you can solve a particular problem, how vital is it that you have experienced that exact problem in terms of the value of the practical experience versus the 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 knowledge of the theory. Cool. This is a good one. Um, I'm okay. So my first thought when you were started saying that is it's it's a ten. But here's the thing: there's so many pieces to this as well that I'm going to take it back to um, ballet teachers and ballet dancers because mm. this is where I started. A lot of people that are good enough to get into companies don't have the, they're they're amazing, amazing technicians, Mm. but not so good at being able to teach. I was the opposite. I'm really good at teaching. My students got fantastic results, but I was never good enough to get into a company. They're actually two different skill sets. So you do need to be good at what you're doing, but just because you've worked in that industry doesn't mean that you need specific results. I didn't need the results of being in a dance company to be a fabulous teacher. So this, I find this really interesting in the coaching world because people, a lot of people will say, uh, you know, you need to get those results. You don't need to necessarily get them for yourself, but you 100% need to be able to get them for your client. That's a really good analogy, and I was going to like tennis coaching as an example. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the best tennis coaches weren't necessarily champion players, Mm -hmm. but their ability to impart their knowledge or or their their skill set is has 
is what made them a, a great coach and what then has has led to 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 the players. So I, I really take that on board, and that's a that's a really really good response. I actually thought of while you were mentioning that, and it was as my little brain ticks over. <laughs> What is what value do you place on failure? In other words, again, you know, we we hear about, uh, you know, read books about people who have followed, who have taken the path, you know, do what other successful people have done, and we model that, and that is really, really drummed into us. You know, you want to be like Roger Federer, you got to do what Roger Federer does and, mm-hmm. and, and what he did. How much, how much important are the lessons from, I, can, I, I can't guarantee to tell you exactly what you should do, but by God, I can tell you what not to do. <laughs> exactly. God, I can tell you what not to do. <laughs> exactly. So, and that's really, failure is absolutely a hundred percent like needed, and all of us fail at things anyway, or as I pr- prefer to say, learnings anyway, because mm. I don't really think that we fail unless we don't get up again. That that potentially is a fail, but generally mm. something's going what wrong. We're learning, and and we need that feedback mechanism all the time. If we don't have that feedback, then we're not able to to change it and do something different. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> absolute mental blanket where I was going because there was something you said specifically, and I was going to dive into that, and I've just it's just flown out of my head. So, but- so I, I, I guess my, my point was, you as a let's say um, a potential client of mine, how much value do you put in my experience as a failure? I know as an individual, I get that we need to you know, fail forward and you're right. It's only failure if you don't get up and, and, and keep mm-hmm. trying. It's a learning experience and f- failure for me is a, is it a, 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 a subjective word? You know, it just mm-hmm. means different things to different people. Mm. But the importance of working with somebody who has failed, how important are those lessons for somebody who is moving forward? So I guess that was... Yeah, okay. I actually think it's so valuable and I'll give you an example of this. Um, I had a client that had had um, a coach who was super successful but that had this, you know, no one's an overnight success but that had this quite easy path where a few things had fallen into place. What happened was that this client that came to work with me was like, I don't understand. I don't understand why I can't get this. And what ended up coming out was because I had done it so many different ways in so many different capacities and failed in all of these different areas as I was going through, I was able to be able to say, okay, it could be this, let's try this. Or no, I can see that that was the issue. You need to try this. Where she wasn't getting that depth of coaching from another coach because they hadn't even acknowledged or noticed that there were Mm. things that they hadn't failed at. So the depth that that person was able to coach was at a very, a much more shallow level. They had really, like they were very successful. It was a very successful Mm. person, but hadn't actually sort of been what I call in the trenches and hadn't had some of those some of those things. No, because we've failed, it doesn't mean that we're stupid. It just means that maybe we're moving fast. Maybe something didn't go as we thought it would. Maybe an algorithm changed. Maybe we were working with a different ideal client. I mean, there's so many different things. I mean, I remember when we had the shop, there were, you know, there was one year that we didn't do a great year. It was because the pipe out the front burst and the street was shut for six months. But that doesn't mean that I failed, minor, right? Minor, <laughs> minor detail. <laughs> but these things happen to us mm. and it's how we pivot out of those. And these things mm. give us learnings that we're then able to take into our coaching or our speaking mm. or, you know, our consulting, whatever it is that we're doing. So I think I personally think that someone that's failed can give you a huge depth of understanding and able to give you a much broader application for what's going wrong. 
Mm. That, that's an interesting, interesting. Uh, I've always threatened to write a book. Uh, I can give you advice, not because I'm smarter than you, but because I've done more dumb shit than you. <laughs> I would probably, I would buy that. I would definitely buy that. <laughs> I, I, I've uh, I've had many people say, "Con, you should write that book." <laughs> yeah, and I love the title. P.S. Definitely would, keep do, that. Do, 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 do you like that? <laughs> yeah, I do. I love I should, that. I, I should copyright that. Yeah, definitely. Samantha, I just want to wind up. Um, <laughs> a discussion would not be uh, complete without some COVID commentary. <laughs> um, as much as as much as I'm sick to death of it, you guys unfortunately have been locked up for <laughs> I'll say locked up, not locked down, locked up for for many many weeks now, and and it looks like you guys are going to be there probably for at least another four. Uh, definitely for another four, and yeah. I'm going to guess probably eight at least. Probably, yeah, until. Uh, uh, anyway, we won't go into the vaccination rates and, and, and stuff yep. like that. My question really is about obviously businesses such as such as yours uh, and mine to a to a certain degree, we function without um, you know a shop front as such. Mm-hmm. Businesses, and again, the hospitality industry we know uh, has been absolutely mm. hammered. Uh, the travel industry has been mm-hmm. absolutely massacred. Mm-hmm. I just see this really horrible uh, increase in in insolvencies and Mm -hmm. real heartbreak at some point because as a small business owner, and when I say small, even if you've, you know, a few million bucks, whatever, a few employees, how long can this continue? Oh, I'm my heart is just breaking watching some of the things that are happening in Sydney. Starting off every single week, with bills before you've even begun the week, like Mm. from someone that has run traditional business, uh, it can't continue. Like there is just no way it can continue. I actually said to somebody this morning, I I think that at some point, and and not just Sydney but but Victoria and I think nationally almost, it's going to come to a point where people are going to go, you know what, enough. We mm-hmm. just we we just we're just hemorrhaging here. We're just bleeding to death. Mm-hmm. You know what's worse? I'm going to die of starvation, or, or I'm going to contract COVID. Like mm-hmm. you know, um, it's just it, it's it, it's heart wrenching. It's absolutely yeah. heart wrenching. Samantha, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I've I've learned so much. Uh, you can uh, send me the bill. Um, <laughs> it's like <laughs> I, I said to somebody, I'm I'm just asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> somebody actually accused me of doing this program for a way of getting cheap consults or for a consult i actually didn't think of that um Smart. samantha yeah i was gonna say there you go there's a there's a novelty samantha it's been an absolute pleasure um i wish you well uh, stay safe I, I my heart goes out to you guys over there in new south wales um folks i highly recommend uh, you latch on to samantha's podcast thought leaders business lab There's some fantastic content in there. and um, Thanks so much, Con. It's been awesome.